Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. We are live on a Monday in Studio B. BYU in the top half of the conference standings at 5-5. Five and five. This seems like their best chance to move above 500 this week with UCF in Pro Bowl and then we a road game at Oklahoma State. Oklahoma game Four, yeah, it's, it's right tomorrow now. Tomorrow and I think that the man who has moved into the Cougar Council Room will agree with us. Jonathan Tavernari is with us on the show to break down BYU I basketball. I don't know, Mr. Rogers, the Brazilian Mr. Rogers. Was I there. love it. The vest is rocking, bro. <laughs> I, between I'm being a wartime conciliere now, apparently, <laughs> since I'm a advisor in the, in the room, and the Mr. Rogers, you know. But There's I, a lot going on. I, yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, let's talk about a, a little-known story where you actually got offered a workout with the Panthers. Speaking of NFL. In the spirit of football in the Super yeah. Bowl. Yeah, so I was, I was traveling back from one of the seasons, in between seasons, and uh, uh, the team takes care of all of that stuff. So sometimes you have two layovers, sometimes you have one, sometimes you have four. And uh, in one of my layovers, I was on a flight, I think it was from Detroit to New York or something like that. And I'm sitting down and start talking to somebody, start a conversation, and, you know, I, I don't know football like that. You know what I mean? Like it's – and so – I start talking, do introduce himself, Ron, and start chatting. As for my name, I tell what I do for a living. Then he starts looking YouTube videos of me playing basketball. And he's like, hey, can I pass by? I'm like, sure, go ahead. And I'm, I'm, I can't wait to get back to Utah. I'm not sure who this Ron is. I have no idea who he is. But I'm like waiting to get back to America. I want to enjoy my summer. It's, I'm done with my season. And comes back, he's like, hey, let me introduce you to this other guy. Uh, my name is Ron Rivera. I'm the head coach of the Carolina Panthers. <laughs> and uh, this right here is one of my offensive coaches, tight end coaches. And I started talking with him, and he's like, hey, so here's my card. Turns around, writes me his cell phone number. He's like, hey, um, we're going to be in touch. You know, we would love to have you come to our facility and maybe try out to be a, <laughs> a tight end. There are six, six with good hands, There are a lot of players, you know, that have made the transition and so on. And uh, I'm like, fine. I take the card and just put it in my pocket. And I'm like, I can't wait to get home. Get me the Cafe Rio. I need to go to Tucano. <laughs> I am dying to get back to America. A few weeks go by. I think it's um, 4th of July or Pioneer Day. We all do a barbecue those days. And uh, I get a call. And I'm with my brother-in-law, massive football guy, right? And I'm like, oh, hey, hey, listen, I appreciate it. I'm not interested. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. And I hang up. My brother-in-law's like, who's that? And I'm like, some guy that coached for the Panthers. He's like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I tell him the story, and my brother-in-law is, and he's a pretty big guy, and he's ready to, like, tackle me. Say, what are you doing, yeah. right? Take the yeah. trap! And I'm like, I'm like, bro, let's just go to Seven Peaks or something. Like, <laughs> who cares about all of this, right? I need to get a workout in. And I so, love that. Yeah, but that's how, that's how it went. And this is, I think it was 14 or 15, so it was before they went to the Super Bowl, but Cam Newton was there. Yeah. And so, you know, what wow. could have been? JT, what a huge mistake you made playing professionally, <laughs> successfully in Europe when you could have been a practice squad guy for the fans. And that, that was my line of thing. I'm like, I'm not going to stop playing in Europe to come yeah. and be a practice no, guy. No, no. But, yeah. That's so. funny, man. That's a great story. <laughs> I love that. All right. Yeah. Now that the football and Super Bowl talk is out of the way, and again, yeah, that is a fantastic story that everybody needs to know, so I'm glad we went there. Yeah. Now we turn the page to BYU basketball, and Jeremy and I were just discussing how weird it got on Saturday night late when BYU had a 17-point second half lead. It got all the way down to two, and then Jackson Robinson hits that massive three. Are you concerned at all with how BYU is closing out games because there's this rhetoric of, well, they just don't play well in the second half. Are you concerned with this? So you made a fantastic point. Hey, it's hard to win games regardless of where you play in conference play, um, but even more so in the Big 12. And then you pointed out it was a hard thing for row teams yes. and all that. And so I get it. But I think what to me is if we need a bucket, we need an absolute bucket, is and I'm glad that Jackson made the three-pointer because he he can get a bucket. Um, is a three-pointer from the top of the key the very best play that we can come up with from a timeout? And I don't know the answer to that, right? Obviously, the the, the people in that room and coaching they know the answer to that. But I go I always go back to to my teams because you know towards the end of my career, Jimmer became Jimmer. But to your point, this is a team. They don't have a 15-point score and so on. So I go back to like my senior year or even my freshman year where 
we could dump the ball to Keeney Young and then to Trent placed it and then to Lee Kamard and not necessarily an outside shot running a play. And so um, my so I'm not necessarily worried because I agree with you, but I would say is what happens in a conference tournament where in a neutral side or an NCAA tournament game where you just need to get a bucket. You don't need to go ahead. Are we going to give the ball to Foose on a post? Yeah. Are we going to wait for Ali to just, you know, do one of their movements around the perimeter? So I don't think it's necessarily a problem, but I will say this. Um, the fact that Jerome Tang then puts them on blast and says, we knew we we're going to go back in the game because that's what they do. That's how they play. Um, <laughs> I'm the type of guy that if, you know, and I said before the season, you know, when BYU got picked, to be like 13th or 14th, like yeah. you print that, you put on everybody's locker, you know, like it's Gru and the Minions, and you just <laughs> cover everything <laughs> with they let you back in the game. Because one of the things that I feel like our teams did is even against the New Mexicos and the UNLVs, you know, and, and so on, was put teams away. At the Marriott Center especially. If you're up 15, you go up 25. You don't go, you know, up 5. So to me is, you know, something that you have to pay attention, but not necessarily a concern now because it, it, it's a brutal conference. You know what I mean? Let's answer uh, your question. I think, I think if Dallin Hall was having a better game, that it's clearly Dallin Hall in that moment on a screen and roll and you're creating. And if it's not him downhill, it's you're dumping off to Foose. And if it's something's open, you're kicking and you yeah. get an open shot. I think that's what it'd probably be. And Dallin, as a freshman, had some clutch shots. Which he Creighton, notably. Um, there were some others, right? That's probably what it is. But Dallin didn't have a great game. Yeah. So other people had to step up. And there probably could be. Like if Jack's got enough shots, he'd be a 20-point scorer. Um, one point to that, and I agree with you. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember. Um, it's a blessing and a curse, kind of like Monk. I remember all these basketball plays. What was the play that they ran in the last possession to try to beat Utah? It was Dallin Hall. Dallin, it was a downhill. dump to, uh, to Ali, a kind of the, a mid post, high range, hand and, off. and hand off with Dallin. So I would agree with you on that. He was a little sped up in the ball. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, Richie Saunders is wide open in the corner for a three, which is the alternate option, but it just fell if out of bounds. If he can turn the corner. Yeah. yeah. And if he sure. turns the corner, maybe it's left. Yeah. yeah. I like the, the ball in the hands of Dallin Hall. I'm probably yeah. his number one fan. I, I, think he, I think he is a largely underrated player. Yeah, he didn't play well, but again, this is a team, yeah. Yeah. and there are a bunch of dudes that can lift other guys when they are not having a good game. The one thing I would add to that is, and I, I know you guys mentioned before, I, and I understand that if you would have um, add you know, Atiki to the equation, there's 10 players playing. And I, Atiki, Atiki is probably the only one that we have It's a true rim protector, right? Yep. But so far, he hasn't been needed. I think that between now and the NCAA tournament, he is going to be needed once or twice. Um, but adding to that, I don't see why Trey shouldn't be playing five to ten minutes a game. So you want more consistency there. Well, but here's why. Because if you're taking away Dallin, who right now, who is the, the secondary ball handler? It's Jackson either Robinson. Jackson Robinson or if Spencer Johnson. If it's not Trey Stewart. But why not Trey? I feel like Trey could easily give you six, seven minutes where Dallin can go to the bench you know, just catch a breather, recover a little bit, and, the, you know, he can keep going and going and going. And it's and probably, so, what, two, three-minute stretches or something like that, right? Perfect. And make him that he plays about eight minutes a game. Games that Dallin isn't playing as well, maybe he gets 9, 10, or 11 because of foul trouble or this and that. But then at that point, you also take the pressure out of Jackson of having to bring the ball up and then set it up and then running around to come and get a shot again. And so I, I, I think that maybe getting a little bit more consistency out of putting Trey in so you can give ja uh, Dallin a little bit of a breeder, I think that's a no-brainer to me. Let's talk about this week. Uh, BYU has an opportunity here with UCF at home. It's going to be a tough game. It was a tough win on the road there. But you're at home, so you like your chances against anybody. And then you're at Oklahoma State, who has a couple of nice wins, but they're the team that feels the most beatable on the road. You always got to win both this week, right? Just get – Get a couple games above 500. Give yourself some room here. I, uh, at the beginning, and I say this every time. Um, at the beginning of the season, you said, hey, if we get 10, 11 wins before conference, then you probably need seven, eight, nine wins in conference and then maybe one or two games in the Big 12 tournament. And then you said, I think if we go three and four in February, we're going to be set. Uh, we are. We have both of those things in place right yes. now. Yeah. And so a three I three and four January set them up for something pretty good. And, and then looking at the remaining schedule, right, with eight games, you know, they win against UCF at home. 
then they win against TCU at home. At that point, to me, one between Baylor at home and Oklahoma State on the road, you have to win those. One okay. of these is not like the other, though. At Oklahoma State, and I, I think you got to go win that. And I understand. You won at West Virginia. Yes. You won at UCF. you got to go win at Oklahoma State. And to your point, you get a 20 wins, you're a lock to the NCAA tournament. Then you're a lock. We'll talk about that coming up in the next segment. Because someone, John Gasway of ESPN is like, BYU is a lock. JT, yeah. I'm, I, they need a few more wins. I'm riding with nine wins in conference. I think this team will ultimately end up with probably nine and nine in the record spot going into the conference tournament. If they're nine and nine, then you have 21 overall wins. And now you're talking about a five or a six seed. I, I would kind of just, I agree with you, but I would present it in a different way. If they get to 21 wins, then we might all be going to the game in Salt Lake to watch BYU. <laughs> By the way, oh, Hama, amazing that Hama and I have already agreed. We have a pact. We're blood brothers now. Yeah, okay. So I'm kind of part <laughs> Polynesian now. Shout out to Hema Hemuli, yeah. our great producer. Hema and I are taking our shirts off. <laughs> And we are looking right now. We're recruiting. Where, which camera am I looking at? Hey, we're recruiting right now, me and Hema, for a third person to join the BYU <laughs> on having our shirts off painted? and our bodies painted. <laughs> so the applications are open. DMs are open. Me or Hema, please, uh, please tag them right now. So I, I agree with you. Are you the B, the Y, or the U? Um, I don't know yet. So <laughs> Let's it, go with the Y. Yeah, we're, yeah. you know, it, we're, we're descending that, yeah. but. The point is, if they get 21 wins, I don't think they're not only a lock, they're playing for a seed. They might play in Salt Lake City. That's so that, fun. That's my perspective. So we almost fun. played in Salt Lake City my senior year oh. had we beat Kansas State. But that Kansas State team was loaded ended up going to the Elite Eight. But in the second round, which was in Oklahoma City, yeah. in Big 12 country. In Big yeah. 12 country. I remember. Incredible. Yeah. Was JT, it's great to have you in the studio, I man. I appreciate it, guys. Ali Farouk Manesh, right, before or after that. Ali Farouk yeah, Manesh. That was, that was yeah. wild. Kansas, which yeah. is crazy. Hey, women's hoops at UCF tomorrow. So Shep's getting that butter beer at Harry Potter land.